All right. Okay, cool. It's back again to continue on our expedition of introduction to generic science. This is... Uh, so before we go on to the second half, that is chapter three, four, and five, uh, Jeremy thought it'd be a very good idea to talk about the generic a priori, generic a priori. Mm. So what is that? What is that then? So the generic a priori, also known as the subtracted with subtract without subtraction is, um, is a concept that kind of like the synthetic a priori and the other forms of the a priori and Kant um, kind of exists within these sciences in the first place. Um, it kind of makes up the point of what um, constitutes these sciences. Um, so a generic a priori, as he says, Larwell says, is only called subtracted because it conserves the, its link with the occasional language that it does not abandon. Right. So right, it's, right, it's, yeah. it's an a priori in the sense that it exists prior to, but is not constitutive of the kinds of things that it, it determines. Yeah. So <clears throat> this generic a priori um, kind of comes to be uh, known as man in one way or another, but also can be whatever really, whatever really constant thing that appears throughout these uh, circumstances as occasions or symptoms or materials um, things that uh, the thing that exists within all these things um, but the a priori is um, a kind of uh, it's it's a kind of uh, a, like a, a term that necessarily poses um, a sort of uh, non-philosophical truth um, something that precedes this sort of authority of truth in the philosophical and scientific sense. And it's just, um, like, it's capable of producing these effects of truth. It's capable of producing the, um, these, the symptoms that we know as the truth as such. So it comes to be um, the common strain, as he puts it, through Kant, um, it is real as opposed to the imagination that it appears from in Kant. Um, he qu I'm quoting here. Uh, we therefore produce their generic combination by their being like science and philosophy, not in science or else in philosophy that they are assumed separated, but through epistemology, which is first in relation to these separated disciplines. So epistemology is... The way in which we come to know things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so instead of uh, oppose, uh, like creating a new epistemology, he suggests that we create a non-epistemology, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. I think is very important for us uh, as people who are stepping into non-philosophy for the first time and want to kind of have um, a stance in terms of. Um, uh, or an understanding of this uh, in relation to how one comes to know things in non-philosophy. So I guess we can continue on with our discussion with uh, <clears throat> chapter three. With chapter three here. That is epistemology and non-epistemology. Mm -hmm. That is the that's the name, right? Yeah. I'm not yeah. lying. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, what is epistemology then <laughs> for for Larwell? For Larwell. And, and why is non-epistemology uh, an answer to it? So epistemology, uh, but he also hyphenates epistemo with log logical. Yeah. Um, so this is something that is not uh, foreign uh, to Larwell's work. Uh, he tends to hyphenate between uh, something with logi at the end. Right. Uh, perhaps uh, a residue of his Derridian Heideggerian roots. Sure. Uh, but it's also uh, an, like in a, a biography of ordinary man, he talks about anthropology. Uh, so like separating anthropo and logi from each other. Uh -huh. um, but to assume their separation when they are not separated at all. Mm -hmm. um, but here 
<clears throat> epistemology as he defines it, um, it, like he states that epistemology would command science and philosophy, um, but like a like a division of labor in thought would constitute it a form. Yeah, but it's not neither for him philosophical nor scientific nor separately nor differentially uh it's a symptom it's a it's a fundamental symptom for him um and it's it's directly opposed on the empir uh, to empiricism um and by empiricism here he's talking about like more or less the objects of experience and understanding the 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 world through not so much sensations or intuition but things that are given you yeah know? Um, empiricism for him is not like that of uh, you know sensations uh, but rather what's been there what's been given you know either through history through the material the great liter uh, great literature or whatever um, so here uh, epistemology so once he kind of distinguishes between epistemology and non-epistemology he's trying to think of through uh, a mixture uh, the doublet between um, empirical and transcendental sure um, doublet, yeah, yeah yeah which i think is something that foucault and deleuze are most notable for but here he says that this is a it's a real transcendental doublet that needs to be put to the forefront um whereas uh you know the empirical is mainly not to be treated as the the evidence or the uh the truth to the the thing itself mm -hmm. but rather a symptom so this epistemological kind of approach um, or a non-epistemological approach is the development of a way that, um, if you just give me one second, uh, is equivalent to that of a science thought. Yeah. Um, and it's meant to be uh, equivalent to a science of philosophy that is subtracted from epistemology that we kind of grant for what science is in the first place. Sure, yeah. Um, so non-epistemology is formalized, uh, neither tendential nor historical, but it's just meant, meant to be um, some sort of like an occasionalism in a way. So the occasional, the symptomatic, the, the material that he kind of treats as equally uh, effects of the real. Yeah. And I'm putting of in the brackets mainly because of the... Uh, whether or not it belongs to the real or not is not the question. It's not about conditions of possibility. It's a matter of it being manifest in all these circumstances. Yeah. Um, so non-epistemology is meant to be a unification of scientific knowledge and philosophical knowledge. Yeah. Uh, under science, but not in the sense of like science as we tend to think of it in the spontaneous sense of it, but more about the experiential and the experimental kind of components that come with uh, science. So I think this is also a play on the French word of uh, experience. Yeah. Because that also means experiment. Yeah. So this is kind of uh, a mystical science in a way, you know. Um, so it's not positivist. It's not spontaneous. It's not. It's something like, you know, um, like I keep on rep repeating unintelligible, like something completely void-like. Um, and uh, dark, sombrous, as it were. Yeah. So. And he also says that that it seems that be as though this generic science, generic philosophy, is much more closer to the average person than to the philosopher. Mm -hmm. So that, it, and it gives, at least that in my mind, invigorates or reinvigorates the sense that what he's trying to get to is really the basic, the generic, the what what is what you said as being like the given mm -hmm. rather than the sensational, which is often foreclosed to, you know, the, you know, the average person, you don't get it, stupid pleb. Yeah. Stay over there and, yeah. and let us figure this out. Yes, exactly. So there is a kind of, you know, it, it is 
like democratic in some way mm-hmm. without all the negative kind of connotations implied with that like the you know the, you know everyone coming together and then yeah. being subsumed under the category of like the transcendent philosophy or whatever mm-hmm. uh, where it's being like a a radical openness mm-hmm. at least that's how I understand it mm-hmm. so where does this distinction then lie when he gives us a I guess a this a distinction between what he calls a general equivalence versus like a generic mm-hmm. indepotence mm-hmm. idempotence so generic idempotence versus general equivalence uh, where he 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 says that the general equivalence wants to eradicate generic indepotence mm-hmm. wants to say get, get just completely erase it from memory whereas generic idempotence mm-hmm. wants to uh, transform general equivalence mm-hmm. or to yeah general equivalence to make it into something other than itself yeah uh let's see i don't know if you have any more to say about so that so <laughs> this is this is in particular the section uh democracy of the last instance in the sciences so uh in this section um he proposes um uh, six you know kind of statements theses kind of framing um the distinction between general equivalence and generic idempotence general equivalence is kind of um is a is a lie you know okay it, it's it's superficial it's yeah. it's it's impossible and i think that also um general equivalence is kind of um uh, it, it's not the ideal of philosophy or the ideal of science it's, it's idealism yeah. you know it's just that's that's it's um it assumes that equality is um, possible only through um, the uh, popularization of kind of uh, the the work that um, democracy kind of gets its name for, you know, in the first place. Yeah. Um, and he writes, democracy cannot without contradiction be the object of position in the interior of philosophy and only be do- doctrinal or theoretical rather than really determined by man in person. So the thing is, um, he's kind of like critiquing um, the philosophies of democracy, you know, mm-hmm. like how a lot of uh, philosophers who like to um, propose a democratic shift in thought don't actually do what they say or say what they do. Yeah. Um, and more importantly, um, it never has a uh, removed um, kind of implicit notion of the popular or the people. Um, so it always has like a cultural connotation or an agonistic approach or, you know, all these different kinds of understandings of democracy that don't actually radicalize that kind of concept in the first place. Yeah. So. The difference between equivalence and idempotence comes down to um, how one recognizes that equality is um, not common. What is common is idempotence, um, which is more about this lack of raising up to a higher power um, and flattened entirely impoverished as it were yeah that's interesting i like that um and he has how like he said in the second thesis um democracy of the last instance could after all be called communism and subtracting this last from every historical precipitation as much as its spontaneity spontaneity if the common of communism was comprised as the generic if communism was comprised as the generic constant of history so the thing is you know, this is not far off from Marxist thesis that this is not necessarily the ideal or that it's going to end up being the case. We have to struggle for it. But it's also something that is like um, uh, meant to be uh, what he calls a non communism later on, but like this is supposed to be subtracting from the historical and the philosophical conceptualizations of communism. Um, and that equality is never effective. It's always uh, unequal. Um, and it's an equality that's always understood in terms of the world and never understood in terms of man or 
individuals. So I think it's it's that radical decision, distinction between individuality and the world, or man and person and the world, and how philosophy seeking to exit from itself, its only exit is its is is its own imagination. Yeah, you know, so we've never really entered that, and the common strain, the, the generic, is something that kind of shares that history of the common, um, the commons, really. So it's more about finding this common ground. If, if, if it were the uh, lowest common denominator, uh, the last instance would be the lowest common denominator. I think that would be a way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but not in the sense of like how it could be one, you know, in the last instance. Yeah. If, if you think about how one is the last, one is the one is the, the, the only thing that could get. If you divide by one, you always end up with one. Yeah. So it, it is a kind of like mathematical kind of statement here, but it's also meant to be an equalization, not so much of an equivalence, you know, um, which I think is a distinction, uh, not so much linguistically or semantically, but like um, uh, equalization could be like um, flattening down to a single level, whereas equivalency is this is equal to this. You know, that's not how that works in this way. Yeah. Um, so uh, he says that a, a perfect example of that would be science equals consensus. Yeah. Uh, that's the example that he gives, but that's not what it is. Science is not consensus. If we said that consensus was democracy and that's how we end up to building a better world, that's not how it's going to work. We can't really consent to um common ground on that way you know what what uh it sounds very uh romantic but it's a little bit more radical in a way because generic democracy as he says is to transform the relations of philosophical capture domination and reappropriation but also the attempts of scientific rebellion and it's meant to um generalize all levels of research, uh, all levels of faculty and whatever, to a, a standpoint where it's beneficial uh, for the ideals. Yeah. You know, leading to where, leading to what, and who's steering it. And that steerage is the last instance. So I think that's that's how I would phrase it, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as he as he says, and as my notes tell me, uh, <laughs> disciplines to be organized, at least for him, I think, uh, in accordance with man in the last instance, or mm -hmm. man in last instance, mm -hmm. um, which I find captivating and mm -hmm. also extremely cryptic. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult not to, to to pick a side, and at any time I think I I understand it, I'm like, wait a second, mm -hmm. figure this out, David. Um, <laughs> So that, what else do you have for chapter three here? Well, um, we could talk about the regional, the fundamental, and the generic. Yeah. Um, sure. Mainly because I think this is also a play in terms of, uh, I mean, it's the last section of the chapter. Um, there's a little bit of a term that he introduces in this chapter two, uh, which is called ensembleism. Right. Um, which is very hard to uh, kind of uh, to you know articulate, and I think it's best to leave it for um, a separate occasion. Mainly because ensembleism, uh, this is something that he's critiquing uh, Badiou for, you know, um, and this is come this this kind of subsection comes into play. Uh, in his own book, Anti Badiou, which he just like, it's, uh, Benjamin Noyes refers to this book as like the narcissism of small differences between Badiou and Laruelle, but really there is the small differences matter between yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the kind of like thinkers. And it's a very interesting uh, uh, dialogue that he sets up here uh, between Badiou the philosopher and Laruelle the non philosopher. I will leave it for another occasion to discuss it, but that's something that Anti Badiou picks up. But the regional, the fundamental, and the generic. Um, so this is kind of like uh, 
thinking through um, the notion of the generic in relation to how science and philosophy distinguish between what is regional or local localized knowledge is yeah. and what is fundamental to both of these. But the generic is neither the regional nor the fundamental. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's imminent to, but not constitutive of either of these kinds of instances. Um, the, the, the generic, um, is, is, it's just a wholly other dimension as he puts it. Like, um, it's neither the general, the global, the specific, the fundamental, the regional, the universal, the singular, uh, the full body, the partial object, the molar, the molecular, all these kinds of things. Um, so the generic in this sense is something that is radically simplified um something that is unifying all these instances um and it is an identification of the last instance or uh what he calls an unfolding uh and i and in the in the, the translation that i've done um this comes from uh you know the distinction between amplifier uh amplifying something and then unplifying which he is a term that he comes up with, but I've called it unfolding mm -hmm. or amplification because you are undoing the amplified scope of philosophy or depotentializing its potentials. Right. And reconfiguring all these other kinds of thoughts that are not just put over to the wayside. So, like introducing new thoughts and everything like that. Um, generic universality is um a, you know a, a substitute or just like a you know um uh the removal of the importance between abstraction and generalization which um universalize these kinds of tendencies in the first place in both the regional and the fundamental and lastly um uh you know he talks about how the generic is not to lay it on a classical regional or materialist class or on an already philosophical distribution. So I think that materialism in this way would be non-philosophical philosophy or philosophical non-philosophy in a way. Um, but here it's like uh, the generic is uh, just a, a flattening of the hierarchy between the regional and the fundamental. Yep. Um, a, a flattening of the distribution of the, the knowledges that kind of come up between science and philosophy. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, like he argues that this is a sort of uh, a, a much more than just a reversal, really. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's more of a, a flattening and a non-relational kind of flattening. So it has no sort of like in a non-representational flattening, too. So it's like. You know how uh, we've come to think things through through only representations and then we've had these critiques of representations through representational critique this is a kind of like how does one develop a non-standard representation of the generic yeah you know um, how does this kind of come to something that is not you know identifiable to science and philosophy alone but unilaterally through them mm-hmm so, and I think it's uh, um, a way of removing that overdetermination of existence, of sufficiency, of spontaneity, of positivity, all these kinds of things that kind of push this to the margins. But really, it's not pushing it away. It's really within this kind of thing. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So, and that, I think that takes us to like chapter four too. I mean, this this. This is a continuation of that, like, uh, subjectivity that we had in the first place, you know? Right, yeah. Um, so, and I mean, like, it's related to the, the previous chapter on uh, non-epistemology, but, like, here it's dealing with um, uh, the, the non-epistemological subject in cloning and how um, the subject, as again, is kind of the existent, you know, the, the person that stands in for the in-person or a clone of the in-person it's not a it's not a split between soul and body really but it's kind of like um kind of uh like an additional kind of a substrate of the same thing 
you know, idempotent all the way through. So um, he notes it as a stranger subject, you know, as being of a generic origin, he says that it's the stranger, which is that of a flat circular or non-reflected structure of the philosophizable. Yeah. So it's completely removed, radically human, but not humanist. Yeah. So this is a very interesting and uh, peculiar moment. Or how he also says it, uh, it's like um, the man without subject is free mm -hmm. from the straitjacket of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. Or in relation to what you s just said, uh, man without subject is human free from the you know shackles of humanism or mm -hmm. the kind of privileging it assumes of itself because of the humanist you know tradition yeah absolutely and also the 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 racist and colonial kind of like heritage yeah. that the baggage that comes with that yeah. so um this is i mean it's not supposed to be like this sort of uh, freedom call i don't think you know but i think it it recognizes the 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 radical identity of each individual mm -hmm. uh not to be determined by the sort of uh the, the dynamics that um power and knowledge have put into their ontology and yeah. their being so it's um it's a radical identity um which is a the essence of the non-epistemological subject radical identity it's it's completely different um i don't know what do you have any uh things about chapter things four about chapter four i do what about the milieu the milieu because that's something we haven't really touched on yet so the milieu actually comes up in uh chapter two um where i could just like kind of summarize that and kind of bring it to the um yeah, the fourth yeah. chapter yeah um so the mil the milieu um to kind of turn back to this um is um a matter of like how circulation occupies the um the generic yeah um how it's circulated and distributed um how philosophical circulation kind of mana like makes that circulation and distribution um uh, limited in scope in some way or another but it's um the milieu is it, it's weird to say it like this but like uh taylor atkins uh translated it as mid place uh, which is quite literal, but milieu, if you look at it, it's me, am I, hyphen le. So it's meant to uh, impose this sort of like identity between uh, philosophy and science, that there are two halves that make one, but they don't necessarily are halves. They're just identically the same. Yeah. You know, they're not... <clears throat> The me of the milieu, as he says, is not half, but the unlimited, finite, infinite, and eternal idempotence which determines, i.e., transforms the lu. So it's, it is a half, but which is one. Uh, which means basically that it's just an idempotent identity between science and philosophy. It is the place without place, or place in the sense of like, um, in placing or unplacing kind of things. Um, so to go back to this uh, in, in, in relation to chapter four, um, let me get back to this, hold on. Here we go. He said, uh, there's a chapter, the first chapter of it is from the unplaced to the milieu or de le en place or milieu. Um, so the unplace um, is a way of, uh, transforming what he considers um, used to be the um, way of what he used to do to inverse and displace. Uh, and soon enough, it became the emplacement, uh, not like uh, I am, but E-M, emplacing something. And now it's uh, unplacing, uh, unplacing, or what he says, substituting the non-place or the unplace in the philosophical system of places. Um, so the unplace, uh, as I understand it, is kind of like a, a utopia in, in the very uh, way of phrasing it. But the, the utopia uh, is not an unplace. Uh, 
in this way. And I think this is also like in a kind of like critique of himself uh, from a, the book that preceded this one four years ago, Struggle in Utopia and the End Times of Philosophy. Um, and the milieu, uh, the, the mid place, you know, it's not half, but it's idempotent in the last instance. And he calls it an idemtopos, you know, like a, 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 a linguistic monster, he calls it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's not a, a utopia in a way, but it, it's kind of like if, if we were to um, kind of come up with a, a portmanteau of our own, it would be a U hyphen topia. Yeah. Know, like something that is like uh, indeterminate in yeah. that way. But at the same time, identically in power uh, and the milieu is kind of the, the 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 unilateral duality all these terms i will just say this very bluntly all these terms really do have the same effect all the time sure they they just have different ways of fra- framing it because of like different uh dimensions whether or not it's going to be uh, imminence, which is everywhere all at once, or having to do with places, space, time, temporality, all these different kinds of things. So they do have the same effect. It may sound silly to kind of just come up with all these terms and then, uh, you know, describe them in the very same way, but it's meant to be an ad- like a tr- an attempt at adequacy. You know, how does one render an adequate thought to the real? Yeah. or the one or demanded person as opposed to inadequacy of philosophy or adequacy to science and all these expectations set by this thought to make sure that it works towards that goal. Yeah. So I think that um, as the milieu and the in place or the unplace goes, it seeks to um, remove the positionality or... Um, the figuring out of where things go on a, a, a map and just kind of like flattening that down uh, and putting it to a um, sort of a, um, kind of a transformation of this, uh, of the dominant term, of the dominant thing, of the dominion of the thought itself. So if I repeat myself, that's only because a lot of these things do repeat themselves. Yeah. In, in yeah. Yeah. Way. But I think that's, I think that's sufficient to kind of, uh, to address that. Mm-hmm. But what else do you have? Uh, I don't, nothing about chapter four that stands out. Mm. Uh, I think we, well, chapter four is to kind of tell the audience here. It's kind of a short chapter and takes a lot of the themes that, um, were originally addressed um through the previous chapters yeah and um we're meant to bring it towards subjectivity um or some sort of aesthetic experience of the subject uh and in in relation to epistemology and non-epistemology so i think that like it, it, it is hard for this chapter to kind of like you know i i don't necessarily want to like bypass this chapter but it's also like it's a very straightforward one i think in my opinion because it the the most important one i think is the last subsection which is the critique of the philosophical t- critique of generic man where he takes um another contemporary um michel Henry, uh, right yeah over um uh to that kind of instance and this he comes up with a term called live without life which uh, also plays into the last uh, sort of chapter of the book, but the live without life uh, is a term that I think is first introduced into this book. Um, And it's also like, it's a critique of how life has been a determining factor, you know, like how Marx, the the, the Marx is the statement that I keep on bringing up, life determines consciousness. Um, We tend to have a philosophical conception of what life is. Um, and for life, for Laruel is, you know, it's, he thinks that it's naturalism, it's vital, vitalism, all biologism, 
like all these different types of relationships about what life is socialization all these other things yeah so the lived in this component uh, past participle but also um, something that is the given the things that are already given of this past experience uh, like whether or not it's from history whether or not it's from uh, philosophical text or whatnot so lived experience becomes uh, not so much about like what one experiences in their own life but really the totality of all possible and given instances that have to be experimented on yeah that have to be you know brought about into light and to transfer that so a lot of this is you know uh it, it it's somewhat related to like uh for known uh, yeah. in a way you know um uh, the lived ex- uh, the fact of blackness, the lived experience of the black man, yep. um, talking about how um, how uh, metaphysics cannot account for the lived experience of the black man because it's all only white metaphysics, yeah, you know, and it, white whiteness is always in uh, blackness is always in relation to whiteness. Now, this is not meant to be a, a solving of Fanon's problem, but it's meant to be a method of articulating why that is the case why we run into that situation in the first place it's because the lived experience is not so much what one experiences on their own but also the possible and the given and all the things that have encapsulated that totality in the first place how do we move use that lived experience to go and develop new experiences yeah. something that could come again something that can come anew once each time and whatnot so i think that this notion of live without life is a very good way of uh enveloping that this is not so so much about how do we do it for life but how do we do it once each time yeah you know so it's a methodical way a practical way um but not decidedly the the um the best way Mm -hmm. or uh well, that's up to people to decide whether that's the best way. Yeah, sure. You know, but um, I think it's a method that does not allow for restriction. It allows for more of the possibilities that can run up. And I guess it's a very scientific way of doing things because you're looking through all these different iterations. Want to come up with something new? You've got to look at the past results. Yeah. You know? So I think that kind of sums up uh, chapter four. And chapter five is just philosophy and non-philosophy. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, where he says, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, mm. uh, he wants to think, as I think we've said so far, mm. uh, non-philosophy is thinking about the whole as opposed to philosophy that is concerned with multiplicities or with difference or with mm. you know the classic distinctions found in philosophy. Well, the whole, though, the whole, the one is not the whole. Okay. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the whole, I think, is um, so in French, two uh, is uh, all or whole. So um, uh, from his earliest works, I will argue that um, a lot of his work has transformed over time, um, and there is a consistency. But this one, uh, this early part, like in the minority principle. He asks the question, can we think the parts before the wholes? Or can we think of uh, multiplicities before the state? Or before... Sure. Uh, or um, anything before being. Uh, beings before being. Uh, all these kinds of things. Like, how do we do that before all these other things? So, the one, as a term, I think only uh, comes up in that book as the first instance where he's trying to... Um, radically transform philosophy from within. okay yeah so um the thing is uh you know he introduces unilaterality in that in that term in that text and um and the last instance has always been um seen throughout his text but the one is distinguished from the all because the all is a unity i see the one is just unified it's kind of like like I said, it's a strange kind of monism, but it's not really a monism. It's, sure. You know, like if you send, uh, say that it's a monism, that, that, that implies a, a unity. But it's kind of just like this constant full un, unfolding. Yeah. Not like unfolding. Like, it, like uh, 
like Hegel's unfolding, but it's kind of like, a, how do you draw back an algebra of like reunifying all these broken parts? So um, I think that um, non-philosophy is an implication that says the um, there is no division. It's indivisible. It's uh, uh, it's individual, um, and there are ways that you can think non-philosophy through philosophy or through science, um, or even through neither of those. It's just a matter of trying to do it in a very rigorous manner. So rigorousness means like, I think that it implies both simplicity, but at the same time, looking for all these contradictions and limitations beforehand and trying to like work within them, you know? So, I don't know. I mean, uh, when the, uh, the, 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 like the section on um, the generic and non-philosophy and then the generic and materialism comes up, you get to see this sort of uh, dynamic uh, between um, materialism and non-philosophy that, um, that you wanted to bring about earlier, you know, um, that the sort of uh, dynamic between the two is kind of like a, uh, um, an, an, a, a distinction between the relative and the absolute and, yeah. and the radical. Um, so the radical is what concerns non-philosophy more so than the absolute relative distinction. Um, and that the radical is imminent to that distinction, but not constitutive of either of those. So I think that um, <clears throat> in this way, there's a sort of like transformation too. Um, in these early writings too, um, Laura Wells talking about the absolute, how does one think the absolute? This is something that also, mind you, came out 30 years before uh, um, Quentin Mayasu was a thing to talk about the absolute the great outdoors the outside and yeah, everything like that sure. but the absolute changed eventually to the radical because the radical seemed to be a much more sufficient um, uh, or adequate term than the absolute because the absolute still has philosophical kind of connotations to it nobody ever thinks of the root and um, the image that he gives um in one of his later works is the uh, like turning to a Lacanian kind of thing. What is the square root of the negative, the negative one? Yeah. And it's the imaginary number. Yeah. So this is kind of like, how does one root that imaginary number in the real, as opposed to rooting it in this looseness, this, you know, like um, <clears throat> kind of a, a more of a symptom of the real than a, than a, you know, a standalone, a yeah. generic cause. So, I don't know if what else you want to pick up here. I don't know. I think that covers it pretty well. Mm. Um, yeah, there's nothing I would want to add to that because I think that that is like certainly uh, goes far beyond my knowledge of the matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just want to, uh, you know, like I want to hear what your thoughts are on the whole process of this thing, you know? Yeah. Um, what what do you think of the uh, the book? If I liked it, um, but I, I I have concerns. Mm. So when we're dealing with like this flattening, which mm. I think is a noble project, mm. I am at one time um, very appreciative appreciative of it. But at another time, or on another level, I'm thinking that maybe there are certain you know ideas, certain regions, certain kind of epistemic frameworks mm -hmm. that we need to hold in higher esteem mm -hmm. and the reason i say that is because like sure it's great for us to then come in and impose a kind of flattening mm -hmm. but for a long time many people were always you know relegated to that domain mm -hmm. where i think it's like we almost need to give a turn mm -hmm. to 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 an otherness mm -hmm. uh which you know is obviously a problematic term right but to kind of you know break away from the boundaries set forth uh, where I think that it's almost too easy for us to say like yeah sure let's impose this flattening mm -hmm. but I think maybe we've only we can only say that because we've been able to enjoy a certain amount of like uh, 
privilege or philosophies have been able to enjoy a certain amount of privilege having held that upper mm. position work and then say like okay i'm good let's relinquish it but everyone else stay down too like yeah we, we, we need to do that yeah how would you respond to that if you know so the thing is a lot of this is meant to be equalizing so the you know flattening sounds i think scary for a lot of people yeah. like i think that um you know, one of the things that later Larwell works, like, for instance, I'm looking at his last book, and I think this is going to be his last book, unfortunately, um, uh, Tetralogos, uh, which is um, a four-book-in-one kind of book, which is subtitled An Opera of Philosophies. Um, I like to think, and perhaps this is, you know, me being slightly a musician and like wanting to be a recording artist at some point, you know, like record behind the scenes and um, work as a producer or whatever, past life, dreams, whatever. Yeah. Um, he's kind of like a sound mixer. This is a guy that, um, you know, during his dissertation defense, uh, Clarence Rumno, one of his uh, um, uh, supervisors, said to him, you're making music with um, philosophical concepts. And I tend to think that this is a very um, a provocative question um, that you have asked because, like, when we think about flattening, we think about, like, all same playing field, all this kind of thing. But really, what it is is, like, different voices in a recording studio like, coming up and then hitting that crescendo at a point where everything is meeting. Sure. Um, and a lot of this also has a sort of uh, ecological connotation to it, too. Um, there's an essay in one of his books uh, collected in English off of Urbanomic, edited by Robin McKay, called uh, The Degrowth of Philosophy. Um, degrowth being like an ecological movement seeking to remove uh, GDP being the derm a determinant factor of economic... Uh, happiness as well as like seeking an ecological transformation in the process mm -hmm. and degrowth is synonymous with uh, depotentialization of philosophy but it's supposed to be um meant to be uh, used in a way that is like how does one amplify these other voices in the room how does one amplify or cultivate these other gardens that we yeah. want to have in the that's first a good place? distinction so it's i i think that like it allows for a plurality as opposed to this just like here have your ball everybody gets a ball take it you yeah know? like i think that that kind of conception of it is not um viable uh as a flattening goes i think flattening in this way is more of like a flattening of sufficiency a flattening of all the different things where each thing each type of thought each type of discipline each person gets to decide in the last instance, um, the future in person. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, yeah, there's a kind of romantic kind of gesture in that, a very poetic one, but it actually is giving cause towards uh, the relationship between invention and fiction and how all these different kinds of processes don't need sufficiency, they don't need spontaneity, they don't need positivity. What they need is transformation. They need mutation. They need newer modes of thought. Yeah. And it will allow for this transformation to happen. But in order to do that, it has to be liberated. It has to be made generic. And that's why I find this, uh, you know, this book compelling in a way. Um, mainly because it's a, it's, a, it's a meditation on that generic. Um, and trying to um, seek to a popular revisitation of all these themes that have haunted 3,000 years of all thought yeah you know um and it, it's it, it's also a funny thing because uh biography of ordinary man you know plato talks about how an ordinary man gets to be reborn every three thousand years but yet it takes ten thousand years for a genius to to be reborn or something yeah, yeah. like that um this is this is a, a, a um a, a thing to be passionate about like it's it's mainly about struggle for people who he calls, uh, Larwell calls ordinary messiahs, you know, people that are struggling and victimized by the world. And I find that compelling. 
Uh, I find that uh, liberating. I find that, you know, worth the struggle. And we don't have philosophers like that these days, except for like Badiou, who is very invested in the youth, you know, like very much invested by young militants who are in France or elsewhere. But the thing is with our non-philosophers of the world, they haven't, we haven't been very active on that kind of scope. Yeah. It's been very much either para-academic or academic. Mm-hmm. So uh, to, to go back to this flattening thing, I think this it puts into question what we could do with non-philosophy. What is to be done with it? Yeah. You know? So I, I think that answers. Yeah, no, it, cer- it certainly does. Yeah. It's, it's a good way to imagine it away from the kind of uh, immediate reservation I have about it, or kind of immediate concern, mm-hmm. um, but also keeping in mind that this shouldn't just regress into some kind of like basic pluralism, yeah. Like, that that philosophy appreciates, like yeah, the oh yeah, we can just dabble anywhere, we can, and, and yeah. anything is fine, appropriate anything. It's yeah, cool. yeah. It's not about like you know uh, as much as like people fear the postmodern neo neo Marxists that like. <laughs> buzzword about diversity inclusivity whatever yeah this is this is no this is this is your remedy for the 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 the, the alt right if anything yeah it's not meant to be you know part of that uh, cultish figure boogeyman that uh peterson coughs up sure this actually tells you you could be who you are yeah and you could become who you are without becoming what you're supposed to be mm-hmm. so i think it gives a little bit more liberty to that kind of conception than a lot of people kind of fear for you know everyday life yeah and then these are not your 12 rules of life though yeah yeah exactly. you know? <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's that, not a neat uh you know it's not a it's neat not a neat plan. bed it's not a neat bed no no oh well i mean that's i think that's as good a end point as any mm. bringing it very well into the present day in a very mm. pertinent way mm-hmm. uh, but before we actually close do you have anything else anything you want to say final remarks well um, I think uh, the next step is uh, for all the people that are listening to read the book yeah definitely um, read it and uh, to comment on my uh, trans- uh, translation uh, to let me know what your thoughts are of the whole project I'd like to hear if you're convinced or not what your concerns are, if there are any, if you have any, uh, um, you know, conflicting remarks, interpretations, whatever that may be, I'd be, I'd be willing to hear from that. But I guess the last word that I want to say is that the, the, the job is not done. You yeah. Know? Like all this kind of stuff is like, it, you know, like I said, this, this work has been very well received in the philosophy and science communities. Um, Deleuze and Guattari's last book um, favorably cited Larwell's work as like the successor in t- like you know uh, passing the torch as it were to Larwell to kind of develop this work and uh, it sucks that not a lot of uh, his his attention is like you know lately received you yeah know? yeah um, and sadly he's old. Yeah, he's real old. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm just hoping that uh, you know the work continues and that more people are invested and seek to do what Laurel has done for 40 years and to move past that as well. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good, uh, yeah, good ending point there. Mm-hmm. And you already said it, but if you have, if you listened and you have comments, you know how to leave it. Uh, but if not. Yeah, it's cool, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you for having me, David. Oh, thank you for doing this, teaching me about Laura well, (laughs) because otherwise I would have... He's 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 one of those people I was too scared to get into myself, so this was good. And I hope that anyone else was able to actually learn something from it too, uh, which I'm sure you were. But definitely go and read it for yourself. As Jeremy said, it's a very textual philosophy. Uh, and that'll become apparent as soon as you try to read it and the first sentence is like what? (laughs) (laughs) work through it though you'll get through it anyways